please welcome to the stage power move maker Josh Tate. First and foremost, I gotta say, Josh, you look so fit, you look great. I mean, you are living the lifestyle. Yeah, when you're 28, you know, that's what you gotta be after. You know? yeah. I'm looking good, Josh. I'm so happy to have you in the building. I think that there's so much that the um, that the students who are here can get from you, but people who are seeking success around the world and around the country can get from your story. So, with that said, let's take it back to the beginning. Okay. Where did it all start from, jo for Josh? At what stage? Like college? Born? Born? Like where did it all start? Oh. Where did you from? Yeah, I grew up in Danville, California, which is a, a little suburb outside of San Francisco. Okay. Uh, moved there from when I was three from Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, went all the way through high school, and then after high school, I moved to Southern California. I started my college career at San Diego State, uh, which was really more fun than school. And then I kind of reached a point where the fun got uh, way far uh, outside of my uh, control mm -hmm. and was. Uh, recommended by my parents that I find a new location to go to college. So I, I transferred to University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona, and I finished my college career there. Nice. And so I would say that I kind of started like marketing in college because I started doing nightclubs because when I was at San Diego State, all my buddies did nightclubs. Mm -hmm. And when I got to Arizona, like no one was doing it. Is this still why you in school? Yeah, while well, I was a college student. What did you major in? Uh, business. Now, now would you say at that time in your life, were you still that guy? Were you still the most popular guy in the room? I don't know about the most popular, but I stayed socially active. Yeah? <laughs> now everybody, that's one thing about you, right? You work a room like nobody I've ever seen before. Like, this is one of your God-given, and speaking of that, is it a, a God-given attribute, or is it something you had to work on over the years? I don't know. I don't know, I just kind of like, I always, you know, in, when I was younger, I always hung out with older people, and I kind of always found myself to kind of like move into different situations. And I, I always enjoyed hanging out with older people, and I kind of see my son doing the same thing, so yeah. I think it's more of a natural thing. Your, your son's a handsome little man. Yeah, he got it from his mother, for sure. Now, in terms of family life, I know you have one sister. Any more? No, I have two sisters. You have two sisters. Yeah. Any brothers? No brothers. What was family life like for you? Uh, with my current family or my original no, family? No, your original family, your mom and dad. Oh, they're great. Who was Josh in that family? Uh, my mom. Yeah? Yeah, I got it from my mom, for sure. Nice. How about your dad? Uh, he's a different kind of beast. He's, you know, he's a doctor, you know, ran a trauma unit for 16 years, so way more uh, educated and uh, disciplined with his, his school. I wasn't so disciplined with my education. I spent more time on my social life, which my mom would have been more like me. Mm -hmm. um, but he's, you know, he's amazing and he would definitely laid down the foundation for who I am. Now, was school big in your family? No. Was that was it was something? No, that we got lucky. Must go really. I mean, they gave us a lot of freedom to kind of pick and choose our own path. Mm -hmm. So they didn't really put a lot of, a lot of pressure on us mm -hmm. in that way, which I actually wish they would have put more pressure because I probably would have performed better. Um, but they were amazing parents, and they really let us kind of find our own way. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Question. Let's fast forward a little bit. You're out of school. Yeah. What's your next step? How do you? wind up on the East Coast, and we're gonna fast forward a little bit. Yeah, yeah. How do you work your way into the life of Sean Diddy Combs and make your way to Bad Boy? So I was living in LA and I was working for an entertainment marketing company, and I'd never been to New York, but I was always fascinated by New York, and I had to go to a trade show in DC, and I had one buddy that was living in New York that um, I knew from Arizona, and he was out modeling. And so I spoke to him, he said, well, come visit me before you go to D.C. and then take a train to D.C. from New York. So I got there and I stayed in this little teeny little, I mean, I don't even, I don't even know how you call it an apartment. It was like barely even a bathroom and like a place to put a blanket. Uh, so I crashed with him there and I was there like two days and I'm like, this place is amazing. And then another friend said, I said, I want to move here. And he goes, if, if you move here in the next... 20 days, you can stay at my place as long as you want to. Kind of, no kind of challenging. Yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, you won't move here. He goes, I'll put that bet on to you. I said, 20 days? I said, done deal. I went back, 
I quit my job, I collected like $6,000 in commissions, I dropped my car off at the dealership, I moved all my stuff to my parents' house in Northern California, and I was here within 14 days, a one-way ticket. Okay, is, and this is an important lesson. Are people thinking you're crazy at this point? Like, who does that? Any, and speaking of that, any family here in New York? No family. I, I, when I say I knew, I knew maybe four people. And my definition of knowing four people, like if I need to crash at their house, I could have crashed at their house. And this is New York or DC? New York. This is New York. Yeah, so like four people. So you know, job, no job, no Yeah. They're just are they like, looking at you like, this guy's out of control? They're just like, they, they kind of expected it from me, so they weren't that surprised. Okay. Tell me, you're, you're, you're here in New York, you got a place to crash. Yeah, so I got a place to crash, and then, um, and then I had to find an apartment. Like, I'm out looking for an apartment. So I had a buddy that was an actor that wanted to move to New York. And so, and then Flynn that lived here. So we were going to look for a three bedroom. Mm -hmm. So I'm out looking at apartments. And then all of a sudden, my sister calls me. And she's like, I want to move to New York. Look for a four bedroom. And I'm like, a four bedroom in New York? And so sure enough, and this is before cell phones. I think I had pager. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky back then. And somehow I came across a four bedroom, one bath on Varick Street in Soho. And some broker called me about it or contacted me about it and he showed me it. I'm like, I love it, it's perfect. It was like 2,700 bucks for a four bedroom, one bath, like crazy three story walk up. And he's like, well, you gotta come, you know, I need you to sign the contract. I said, what's the contract? He goes, oh, for our broker's fee. I'm like, what do you mean broker's fee? He goes, yeah, we get 15% of the year's rent. I go, oh yeah, that's right. I said, well, let me round up my roommates and we'll all come down and sign the paperwork. I said, no problem. So he leaves and I'm like, fuck that, I'm not paying. <laughs> so I knock on the door on the second floor. I'm like, hey, do you know who owns the apartment or the building upstairs? He goes, yeah, right next door, Atlas Electric. So I go over to Atlas Electric. I say, hey, I saw that the third floor is available for rent. I'm interested in rent. He's like, oh, great, here's our broker's phone number. And I'm like, nah, I can't deal same with it. Same broker? No, same broker. I'm like, I've had horrible experiences with broker. I'd just rather work with you directly. He's like, no, no, we have a broker. We don't have time to deal with it. I said, well, you don't have to deal with it. I'm here. How did they not rent that place? I found it on my own. So I haggle with him for like an hour and I will not leave. I will not take no for an answer. Finally, he's like, come see my brother Arthur tomorrow. If he says yes, then you can take it. I say, great. So I come and see Arthur the next day. I'm 30 minutes in and he's a hard no. I'm like, Arthur, come on, man. What's your favorite sports team, Jets or Giants? He's like, Jets. I'm like, tickets, I got tickets for you. You want tickets? <laughs> I'm like, I know you need a nice suit in your closet. I go, Hugo Boss. Jets tickets and a free Hugo Boss suit. Come on, man, who else, who else is gonna rent your place and gonna provide that for you? And I just stayed on top of him. And finally, he's like, fine, just take it. Just take it. He goes, here's the keys. Leave me a fir first and last month deposit. No credit check, no nothing. Are you serious? Yeah, I got it, got it. Josh, this is an amazing story. Yeah. But you've been saying Josh from day one. The, the, the fact that you would not take no for an answer. Has that always been you? I mean, you try to be respectful in it, but mm -hmm. it's all an art, right? Everything is in communication and finding a leverage point. No, I, I think that that's a wonderful gift. And I think that that's something that so many people who are coming up in business you know, whether they're trying to be entrepreneurs or they're working their way through the corporate system, any boss values that mentality. Anybody who really wants to scale their company, that, will, that mentality will make you instantly hireable and will have somebody take notice of you and want to bring you up in a company. So that's a good, great lesson that you just- Well, you have to. Listen, if you're, if you're a person that takes no for an, for an answer, then you're not gonna go very far in life. Because there's going to always be roadblocks and challenges, and no is an easy word for a lot of people to absolutely, say. Absolutely, absolutely. How'd you meet Diddy? So I met, I didn't meet Diddy, I met Jeff Burroughs, who was just coming over from Arista Records. Okay. And uh, he was coming on to be the president. And when I moved to LA, I wanted to be, I worked at the record label when I was in LA. I say work, it was a glorified internship. I think I got free lunch on Fridays, <laughs> but I loved it. I was the first one there and the last one to leave. A tough break record. Was it, was it, was it paid internship at all? I free lunch. I that's it. That's free. It saved me six bucks. <laughs> uh, and the irony is that the star artist at Tough Break back then, this is 1992, was Tragedy, the Intelligent Hook. Absolutely. So I saw Tragedy at Nick Quested's house last week. No way. I hadn't seen him in 27 years. How's Nick doing? Uh, he's doing great. Nice. So the irony of seeing someone that really was like at, a, at your first real kind of passion job that you had. Do you remember? The start. 
vaguely. He lied, probably, but yeah. <laughs> um, but it was kind of interesting to reconnect with him, so it kind of reminded me of my tough break days. So I, when I moved to New York, I wanted to get back in the music industry, but I was at that weird point where I was like, I was making decent money at my other jobs, so I was too proud to be an assistant, mm -hmm. but not qualified to be a product manager. So I was interviewing for jobs, and I had a bunch of assistant opportunities, and I looked backwards, and I'm like, I should have just taken it because you could work your way up. But I just kept thinking there was something better, but I wanted to do what Rifkin was doing at SRC, kind of marketing music and kind of playing the corporate side and the artist side. Of course. And, and I met Rifkin, and he just gave me the cold shoulder. He's just like, why are you here? And I'm like, for a job. <laughs> and he didn't even open the door for me so he wasn't uh, he didn't he didn't give me the opportunity so in my mind I'm like all right now I want to compete against this fucker so I'm like fucking Puffy's the platform and so in the back of my mind I'm thinking Puffy a week later I'm in in Miami at a tennis tournament that my friend was hosting this VIP suite and Jeff rolls in there with Evan that owned Tough Break from my first job so he introduced wow. me to, to Jeff so it's kind of ir ironic how all the pieces tied together and then I just hung out with him. Nothing really happened. I'm like, you know what? That's the, that's my entry point right there. So I cold called Jeff, and he says, Yeah, come up to the office and let's talk about it. So I presented the idea. I said, Look what Rifkin's doing. Puffy's a brand. Like this guy is. People are way more interested in Puffy and the artists that you guys have. You guys have a better platform. I could be the bridge between corporate America and the artists and creating, you know, money making opportunities. Uh, just not a, a job at a record label can create a new vertical within the business. And the chef's like, yeah, I like that. He goes, well, you know, put together a plan and let's sit and meet with Buffy. So a week later, we got a meeting with Buffy and I take him through my version of a business plan. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. This yeah. is Puffy? Yeah. Right there. Only yeah. I mean, yeah. And at the very end, I put $2,000 a month plus 10% commission. So I'm like, God, I'll show them that I'm all in. Like, I only need you know, two grand. That's just like enough to pay rent, get a bagel and a water if I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, five days a week, not seven days a week. And so he's like, $2,000 a month? I thought he was going to laugh. You know, he pulled up in his, you know, he had like the first convertible 650 and he was flossing. And I thought he'd be like, no one can, you know, what are you going to do with $2,000 a month? He's like, you want me to pay you $2,000 a month? I said, yeah, I want to show you how committed. He goes, fuck you. You eat what you kill. <laughs> he goes, I'm not paying you shit. You eat what you kill. And if you don't want to do that, then I'll get someone else to do it because I already had this idea. <laughs> I said, all right. I go, well, how do I pay my rent? He goes, that's your playboy. That's your problem, playboy, not mine. <laughs> so Puff was a shark. Oh, yeah, he was a bitch. Back then. <laughs> yeah, he was a bitch. So I'm just like, all right. So I said, how many times in your life do you have this opportunity? And I said, fine. I said, I just need a desk and a phone. And if Je if I need Jeff to come on a meeting with me, have Jeff come with me on a meeting. And he said, all right, cool. Jeff will set you up. And that's the deal. You eat what you kill. Yeah, you're speaking his language at that point. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that sounds like it. Just for people who don't know, what was Jeff's role in the company? He was, he was kind of like the new president. So Kirk Burroughs was kind of phasing out. Phasing out, and Jeff was moving in as the president. Okay, you come in, yeah. you're in the company now, you got your desk, you got your phone. Well, I didn't really get a desk. <laughs> Basically, Jeff walked around, and this was the old office. It was still 19th Street. 19th Street. Mm -hmm. And there was a mail room. And in the mail room, there was three desks. Kibo, this desk, and then kind of like an intern desk. Mm -hmm. So Jeff walks around, there's nowhere for me to sit anywhere. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, so you can sit here. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, great, I got a desk. And there was a phone, but they didn't tell me that the phone, you couldn't dial out but no one could call in <laughs> don't ask me why you literally like it's always busy so I'd have to be dialing for dollars and saying oh page me and I'll call you back <laughs> Not real. and so tinkers in there mm -hmm. it might be mm -hmm. Kibo so and, for people who don't yeah. know these are early early you know, people who worked at Bad Boy. Well, they didn't really work. They hung out at Bad Boy. Okay. <laughs> I say work, you get a check for showing up. Like, they got free t-shirt swag and got to say they worked there. Um, and then so the next day, all of a sudden, this Rastafarian dude comes in, Groovy Lou, and he's like, yo, son, who are you? First of all, Biggie had just passed. So there's surveillance outside the building. I'm the only white guy in there, and everyone thinks I'm a narc. <laughs> they have no idea. Like They're like, who is this guy, and why is he here? And Jeff's new, so he's like, it's the old school and Jeff, and then me. Mm -hmm. And they think I'm either there to fix the one uh, copier or <laughs> computer, or I'm a narc. They're not sure how to figure me out. And Groovy's like, you're at my desk. And I'm like, he was like, who are you? And I told him, and he's like, all right, scoot over, I'll share it with you. Which was probably the greatest thing that happened to me. 
because that's like on a Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, Groovy's on the phone with Arista, like, what do you mean I can't get money to shop for the artist for um, Summer Jam? Mm -hmm. you remember, that's when they had the whole lineup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, what is it that you need? He's like, you know, like the flyest Nike stuff. And I'm like, well, just call Nike. They have a, a promotion office in, in L.A. where they send stuff to artists for like product placement. It was like early stage product placement. He's like, what's that? I don't know how to do that. And I go, let me make a phone call. So I get a hold of the girl, Nikita, that was ran uh, marketing at, at Nike and fortunately I kind of knew her, didn't know her great, but you know when you say you work with Puffy, like that's a juice card to pull. I said, Nikita, if you could do me one favor in your life, I need you to send product for the artist for Summer Jam. And this is like on Wednesday, or Thursday morning, Thursday morning, and so we needed it by Friday for the show Saturday. And she's like, oh, the, the, the thing's gonna close in like two hours, do you have their sizes? I'm like, yeah, I'm sure. I'm like, Ruby, do you have everyone's sizes? He's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, how are you going to shop for them if you don't know their sizes? <laughs> so we just took a guess. We went through every artist, and then everyone started chiming in, like, I'm size, I'm size, and they like, slow down. Let's start with the artists. We'll go from there. And so sure enough, like on Friday, like 14 huge boxes of free Nike shit came, and people lost their mind. It's amazing how crazy people will go for free stuff. They thought it was like they, they won the lottery. I'm like... I'm like, oh, this is easy. If they just like free shit, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, and you did it all day, and you did it very well. Yeah, so that came, and then so then I kind of think the word got to Puffy, like, oh, this guy came through with all that stuff, and then I'm like, oh, I'll call my guy at Adidas, and I'll get a bunch of stuff made for free. So the next week, you know, 100 boxes come, 500 branded bad boy jackets and another 1,000 T-shirts, and Puffy walks in, he's like, who the fuck ordered all this? And I'm like, I did. He goes, I ain't paying for it. You paying for it? I said, I'm not paying for it. He goes, I sure the fuck ain't paying for it. <laughs> and I go, none of us are paying for it. He goes, what do you mean? I go, I got my man from Adidas to send this and make it for us. It's great. To give to DJs and the artists. I'm like, it's product placement. It's good for their brand. It's good for us. We got great swag to give out. He's like, you got all this for free? I said, yeah. <laughs> and so then, then uh, he said something to Jeff. He goes, oh, that white boy can hustle, huh? <laughs> And he goes, yeah, I guess so. I mean, he just got a bunch of shit, so. But that wasn't paying my bills. Giving free stuff away was not putting any money in my pocket. It just gave me um, uh, the ability to walk around the office freely and not think that I was a narc. <laughs> <laughs> it also showed Puff your value. Yeah, it yeah. showed him that you had a different hustle. You were yeah. bringing something to the table that nobody in the building yeah. you know, had the ability to do. So that's great. You mentioned being a white boy. I, you know, this is an off-the-cuff question, but how, how the hell did you adapt in it? Because I remember that environment. I remember 19th Street very well. And for so many people, you know, you're mentioning key names that were part of building that bad boy system. And outside of bad boy, it's always perceived as it's this huge company because we were able to do so many key things and really change culture in terms of music and style and swag. But... Bad Boy started in, would you say the office was about two sizes of this room? Yeah, if that. So when you're saying that you're in the mail room, literally you were in an office the size of this with yeah. this, this close to one another. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think there's only like five offices. So being in a black company, only white guy, I don't remember any other white guys, do you? At that Not until later, John Eaton. Man, I don't remember any of on a &R, so. How'd you adapt? Um, you know, the, the irony is, like, I grew up in Danville, which is literally, I think there were two African-American families in our entire town. Mm -hmm. And one was Homecoming King, because he was such a novelty, <laughs> a great athlete. Um, I don't know, I just always loved the music and the culture, so I would find myself at a young age going to, like, Open Coliseum to, like, the Fresh Festivals and Run mm -hmm. DMC concerts, like, at 12 and 13. So I kind of always liked that music and culture, and kind of that's the nightclubs that I was doing. I was bringing hip-hop artists to Tucson and creating shows like that. So it, randomly, I was comfortable in that environment. And I also saw kind of a challenge, like can you navigate these like, unexpected uh, territory? Yeah, it was very unexpected um, <laughs> so many different times in that office. Uh, but Josh, you know, just thinking about you, and there's some key lessons to be learned here. The fact that you, you know, bet on yourself and said, hey, I, you know, I'm willing to eat what I kill. That type of motivation, 
knowing all I have is um, a telephone and a desk, you know, you really had to go out there and make things happen. Yeah. Talk about some of the deals that you brought to the table while at Bad Boy. Yeah, so the irony was Puffy, you know, overnight he was the overnight global sensation with the song Missing You, right? So now he's got the biggest song in the world crossed over every single chart. I mean, I think he broke all types of records yep. in terms of like all the different music formats that are played on. So my grandma knew who he was, right? Like she had no business knowing who he was, but she's like, you work for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so he's doing a, a, a national tour, but like stadiums, not like, like remember. he went straight from like n never performing live to like doing stadiums. And so I'm like, well, who's gonna, be? by the way, the tour's leaving and like, eight weeks he formed it like eight weeks later he's out on the road so there's very little time so i'm like who's going to sponsor the tour he's like what's that and i'm like you get like a corporate sponsor and they get signage rights and meet and greets and all this stuff he goes i don't know i don't got anyone go find someone so i start cold calling i'm like well pepsi's the perfect fit right because they're tied into they they were leaning into hip-hop music a little bit so i cold called rick rock i remember he's the vp of marketing and i left an urgent message and i i, I said you know Sean Combs would love to speak to you. He's a huge fan of Pepsi, and he wants to talk to you about his upcoming tour and how you guys could work together, and I'm giving the spiel to the assistant. And then I get a text, of course, because the phone couldn't call me. <laughs> <laughs> I get a text from his assistant saying, please call me, and so I call back, and she goes, uh, he would like you to speak to Kanetta Bailey, um, and you could talk about this opportunity with her. So, again, I did the spiel to Kinetta, she's like, it doesn't really leave us a lot of time. I said, I understand that the opportunity is too great to not at least take a meeting. So we got a meeting, we talked about what we could do, and literally, like, within two weeks, we closed the deal and got, like, a $750,000 tour sponsorship. Amazing. So he was blown away. Like, you got $750,000 for them to put signage up and this and that. So, yeah. It's a nice little commission for you, too. No, it wasn't. I got screwed. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I didn't get that. Uh, let's just say that uh, he had management in place that was not, uh, was trying to block. I got something, but gotcha. I didn't get what I should have gotten. But it didn't matter. I got an office. Got you. He's like, let's get this guy out of the mailroom. Give him <laughs> someone out of that corner office. He's like, give this to the white boy. <laughs> good man, good man. So, okay, so working close with Diddy. You know, yeah. Then we'll move this on. Working close with Diddy. What are some of the takeaways? What are some of the things you've learned? And, He's such a complex individual for people who don't know him, you know. So I'm asking you this two ways. Some of the things that you learned from his words and yeah. some of the things you learned from just being a fly on the wall, watching him and working with him. Yeah. Well, I think he was, he's one of the greatest uh, manipulators, right? Like he can get anything he wants out of anyone. He can turn it on and turn it off. But at the end of the day, he's always got his best interest at heart. So I, I watched how he was able to move people to get to do things that aligned with his interests. Mm -hmm. So I was always mesmerized on how effective he was in doing that. You know, don't always didn't always agree with the outcome because it was always about him. And I think in every relationship, both people have to feel good about it. Mm -hmm. But he was just a beast. He just knew what he wanted, and by all means necessary, would do whatever it took to get there. But I think the thing I learned most was just like, what do you mean no? Of course no is not the answer. Figure it out. Just figure it out. And he challenged people to like make things happen that they weren't comfortable doing. And then they realized that everyone's capable of doing so much more than what they mentally believe they can do. And I think it just forces people to find a way to come to a solution. I think that's one of the, of the greatest takeaways that um I got from working in the bad boy system. Yeah. There is no such thing as can't. There's no such yeah. thing as no. There's always a solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, even working up under you, you know, you always said those same things. Like, I'll never forget you walk out the door and I'll be completely getting you just make it happen. Mm -hmm. And you can go on about your day. And I'm like, what the? Like, I don't even know where to start with this. But that is the mentality. And that's why that company was able to grow and scale it the way that it did. So. Yeah. How long did you work at Bad Boy? Uh, a little over five years. A little over, why'd you leave? Um, because uh, it just kind of ran its course in the sense of what I was doing. I was creating all these new business opportunities. And again, I was uh, I was participating in the upside. So, I mean, I had some pretty amazing deals in place that kept falling to the wayside because of some d bad decisions he made. You know, he got a felony. Unfortunately, not a lot of people want to be in business with felons. 
especially if they have board of directors and have money from big corporations. So things that would have changed my life and deals that would have changed my life kept getting knocked out. I mean, these were paper deals, like they were ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, I had a joint venture with Nantucket Nectars in 1997 to create a line of fruit juices oh, called wow. Tom Tom and Puff. No like, one. There was no one doing anything <laughs> like that in that category back then. Um, a deal with him with XM Satellite to have a seat on the board in his own channel. A deal with um, Donnie Deutsch to take, basically take what I was doing and create a partnership and create an agency within Deutsch. So like some really interesting things that they think with ICM to create basically what Rock Nation is today with ICM back then. But those were four paper deals ready to go and then his legal problems uh, killed all of them. And then I went back and spent years putting together more deals and then the gun charge situation. So, you know, it kind of took the wind out of my sails. You really were a visionary. I mean, some of these deals I didn't even know about, like, you know, you just having the aptitude to think and really connect brands with um, corporate sponsors or, or connect brands with artists. It, it's, it's amazing. I had no idea. Like, you were that forward thinking. Too forward sometimes. So go ahead, you leave Bad Boy, what's your next step? Uh, so I left and started my own marketing agency called Buzztone, kind yep. of doing what I was doing within that, where I work with brands and entertainers and marketing experiential, not like not like a traditional ad agency. Um, and was doing that for like five, six years and built a pretty good sized company. We had an office in LA and an office in New York. And through that, but I didn't like it because it, it was all service based. And you just like, when you're a talent, like you have juice. When you're when you're asking people for checks as a service provider, and they all oh we have an agency that does this, it's, you just always felt like you're on your hands and knees begging for people for stuff, and I hated that feeling. So I always wanted to own something of my own that I could create, and so I had a guy come to me and said he wanted to wanted our help marketing a line of vitamins to the urban market, and he was a big guy in the space. He had like a half a billion dollar company contract manufacturer and some of his own brands, but what he presented was just absolutely horrible and would not have connected in any way, shape, or form. I'm like, well, if you really want a shortcut, like, let's go partner with this kid, 50 Cent, that has a brand called G-Unit, and he's all about health and wellness, and everyone wants to look like him. They want to look like they have a prison body, not like a, a bodybuilding body. And I'm like, and that's what this guy's doing, like inverted, you know, sit-ups in a, in, in, in a, in a roachy basement. Like, that, that's what people want to look like. So he's like, yeah, who is he? And I kind of give him a little bio on him or whatnot. He's like, that's interesting, let's meet with him. So we go meet and we have a great meeting with 50 and they hit it off and I said, this is how we position it. It's a 50-50 joint venture, but you gotta give him $200,000 advance because so he's committed to like marketing and promoting it. You gotta fund everything, but you know, he'll help you design the products and you're responsible for all the marketing, manufacturing, distribution, and he's in charge of all the marketing. Now, like which 50 at his career is this just after the first year? Yeah. This is before yeah. Give Richard Die Trying? Or just right about that time. So, so he's like, he's just like, he just did he's his prime to go. Yeah, he's prime to go. Okay. Way before Vitamin Water. This is four years before Vitamin Water. Three years, three or four years before Vitamin Water. So, how'd that deal? Um, it went great time. until 50 had to show up on Friday in Long Island at like exit 47 before leaving Saturday for a tour for three months. So they're in Jersey, you're like, oh, I'll just call them all. I'm like, dude, you got to be there. Like, you, like this is like, you got to test some products that he has for you. You're disappearing for three months. Like, if you want this to happen, like, you got to show up. In the real world, people meet face to face when they say they're going to be there for a meeting. I said, it won't go over well if you don't show up. Well, all right, well, I'll be there. Of course, you know, tracking them. The meeting was at three o'clock. Are you coming? Are you coming? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll probably. Go. I'm like, get a helicopter. I mean, <laughs> find a way to make it there. Sure enough, I'm there at 3.30, I'm like, ha, ah, I'm making excuses. 3.45, I finally get in touch with them. Oh yeah, we're still stuck in Jersey, I'm not gonna be able to make, but, but let me talk to Mel. Mel's like, oh great, okay, okay, thanks, we'll have fun. Hangs up, he's like, yeah, I can't be in business with a guy that doesn't show up to a meeting he committed to. Wow. And so it just whoosh, disappeared. Wow. So it was at that time that I was having lunch with one of my best friends, and he's just like, God, you get so close to the finish line with these guys and their lack of follow through or just understanding what it takes to be a real business partner um, kills the deal. So Josh, before we move on to your um, next endeavor, which is eBooks, yeah. let's go a little deeper into Buzz Tone. Some of the other deals that you put together, other clients, some of the other challenges you may have had. Yeah, so I mean, Buzz Tone was actually fun. I mean, I can't, I didn't like always having to like, 
pitch business and do all that, you give away a lot of IP. You, you said you did not. I, I, I just hated when they'd, like, they'd, be they'd be interested and they'd make you go through all these hurdles and putting together a deck and a plan and a presentation, fly to wherever they are, and then you have a meeting and then they go crickets for three weeks. And it's like, oh yeah, we decided to go another direction. Mm -hmm. But you've spent, you know, four weeks and a lot of labor costs and overhead, like developing and, and giving them great ideas that then you see they go take um, elements of it and start incorporating it on their own. And that's the thing. They didn't value the IP and the ideas and the time that it took to generate that and present to them. And I just felt um, I never really appreciated that side of it. But I did, I had some really great clients that like had Bacardi, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. So I think some of the stuff that we were doing with Bacardi, we were early movers in like product placement and music videos. I mean, we were working with Kanye West. I mean, we, we got him to call out, he was calling out Bacardi in his songs, like Bacardi Limon like first album just because we supported him we'd mm -hmm. do his listening parties we'd show up to the set of his videos we'd provide him product he'd be doing events so we were trying to work with artists in a much more authentic you know in a very helpful way uh, as opposed to just trying to cram product into their hand and this is again it's kind of early stage before the whole product placement and the integration was really starting to happen so we were doing a lot of that stuff with a lot of different artists you know we go to mtv awards and do like three or four amazing parties so it was I enjoyed that part of it because it kept me within the, the music community and I was able to leverage brands, money and dollars to do good things with artists or talents or labels. Mm -hmm. So I actually enjoyed that or a New Era, which was a great client, the hat company. Mm -hmm. So presented them a whole concept of taking a, you know, one of those double decker, those articulated buses. You know those buses that have like the accordion style in the middle? Yep, yep, you don't really yep, see yep. many of them anymore. So I said we should create one of those and create a mobile museum. And so we took Jonathan Mannion, who's like created the, the most epic album covers, album covers from DMX to Jay Z, like in history. He's probably yep. the most prolific photographer. I said, let's take all of his amazing images and put it into a bus and then integrate your custom hats. And then we'll bring it to retail, we'll bring it to All Star Game, we'll tour it across the country. So I kind of enjoyed that stuff. Um, and so we were doing things like that, kind of doing things that were very relevant in the culture and then finding the right brands that associated with it. So we're never trying to force a brand that didn't belong in the culture. We're just trying to bring that brand to life in a more relevant way. You know, even as I'm listening to you speak, uh, yeah, a question comes in mind. Have you always had an entrepreneurial mindset? Uh, yeah, because I've never had a corporate mindset. You're either corporate or you're uh, entrepreneurial and I just never worked well and kind of, uh, Limit, limiting roles in whatever it was. Okay, so having this corporate, um, this entrepreneurial mindset, you come to a place within your own business that you start to feel like, you know, I don't love what I'm doing anymore. And that's something that happens to a lot of entrepreneurs. For you, at what point did you realize, hey, I, I created this great marketing agency, I'm doing these wonderful deals, um, we're bringing in revenues, we have, um, offices in New York and LA. At what point did you say, I, I think I need to exit out? I just got a little burnt out on it, just personally. I just was getting fatigued and just felt that and then there's a lot of other people trying to do the same services. They got a lot more competitive. And I, I just got kind of burned out in doing it. So I didn't really have anything that was keeping me super excited or motivated. Well, the reason I ask you this, and again, so many people who are thinking about getting into business who, or who are in business, you go into business because you want to work for yourself. You yeah. want to play by your rules. You think that you can create something that is bigger and better than anything yeah. that exists. But there comes a time that you, the same reason that you decided not to take a job, mm -hmm. you kind of get stuck in your own rut. And, that business that you created becomes your own self-imposed prison. You feel like, hey, I'm literally going to work and I hate my job. Yeah. You know, so were you feeling that way when you decided, hey, you know what? I'm sick of the service industry. It's time for me to go a different direction and create a product. I mean, I just got, it kind of was a natural evolution. It just was, my energy got pulled in this other direction. But, but looking back, and I think that's a challenge everyone faces. So. If I were to look at myself back then, I would have said, you know what? You invest so much time and energy in having your business, like it's your responsibility to, to make yourself happy within that business. And you need to find like what else you could be doing that makes sense for your business that will make you happy. So I think I could have um, brainstormed internally with my partners or with the team and said, all right, like 
what makes us happy? Like, what do we enjoy working on and what do we not enjoy working on? And we could have like really spent more time and energy focused on the things that made us happy. So I think I probably could have done more internal work mm -hmm. to figure that out. And I think there was plenty of other things that we could have done within the scope of what services we provided. Um, I think I just had a couple things that happened that just really irritated me and it just kind of demotivated me to keep, you know, doing service, service. Uh, personally, the business was doing fine and everyone else seemed to be happy, but I could have probably done things differently to find a way to make myself more engaged and motivated internally. Do you think you could have stayed engaged in the, ser in, in, in the service oriented business? I think so. I think I would have just had it done maybe work deeper with talent and maybe created like a management company within there, mm -hmm. like, you know, representing artists for talent deals. I think I would have enjoyed that. So I think that's something I thought about after, that it would have been a nice uh, add-on to the business. Mm -hmm. um, so, because this is before like talent agencies were really seeing the marketing opportunities uh, of artists. Got a question for you, and it's kind of off the beaten trail, but I think it's important, and I'll tell you why. At this point, are you in a committed relationship, or are you a bachelor, do you have any kids? No, no kids. Um, no, I was pretty much single. You were pretty much single? So are you looking for the right one at that point or are you so laser focused on your business? Nah, it's just laser focused on my business. Okay, talk to me about how Buzz Tone is coming to an end. Yeah. You and your friend decide, hey, you know, we need a product and you know, there's millions of products out there on the yeah. market. It could be basketballs, baseballs, it yeah. could be whatever. How did you get into the energy category? Well, it was just after the 50 thing fell through, so I had some experience and I, spent some time looking at the space and I just was just like you know personally I'm just like I need energy like I, I you know wake up early I stay up late I try and stay active you know per, per personally and professionally and I'm like I'll never drink a Red Bull unless it was with vodka late at night occasionally but I would never really choose to do that Monster was the other big drink I'm like there was no drinks that really spoke to me or products that spoke to me There was like emergency that people would take when they felt like they were getting sick or for hangovers or Baraka in Europe Or airborne was just getting really big from an immunity standpoint I'm like how can we create like a powder that you can carry around in your pocket that you could take every day that gives you healthy energy plus other essential vitamins and minerals like take the best assets of, of emergency, the best assets of airborne and Baraka, and then add like something clean and natural from an energy component. Like, I take it every day. Mm -hmm. You know, you take it every day. My guess is we could find other people that would want to take it every day. And we just naively and kind of selfishly created it. Did you create this while you still had buzz? Yeah, so I was doing both. Like, this was like something I developed. And it took a long time to get going. I was doing both for a long time, but I just found myself spending more time on eBoost because I was just more I was more passionate towards it. Okay, is that ultimately what made your decision to shut the doors down? Yeah, we finally, you know, we had a situation where we could have sold the company, and, and I had a partner at the time, and she was kind of running point on it, and I should have been more engaged in that process. Um, but I was just so emotionally, I was kind of detached from it, and I was just getting excited about. And this is before the market crash too. So, I mean, I really. Were you able to tell uh, 90, like, 2000, 2000, I mean, 2007, no, 2008, oh, wait. yeah, like 2007, 2008, um, so it was just fun, it was exciting, like, it was a great time, like, the markets were vibrant, and our, our very first client was the W Hotels, where they put our product in every single hotel room, and, you know, after, stop there, because I don't want to jump too, yeah. too far, fast forward, you're going now into a completely different world, right? Yeah. You, you, you discuss how the idea came to fruition. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people who have ideas. Yeah. People have ideas every day of the week. Yeah. Number one, what gives you the, the, the balls, for lack of a better way to put it, to jump out the window and say, you really, because there are people sitting at home right now, sitting at their desks, sitting at um, their jobs, and, and they're kind of sleepwalking. Yeah. And they have these ideas that could change the world, and they sit on it. Yep. And two years later, they turn on the TV and it's the biggest thing in the world. Like, where does that come from with you to say, you know what, I'm gonna take a chance on myself. You've never been in um, the energy category before. No, uh, you yeah, know, I've always been that way. Like, I moved to New York on a whim, like I didn't really know anyone, so I've always had enough self-confidence, like I'll figure, you know, I've always just assumed I could figure it out, right? I think it also helps that in the back of my mind, I know I have a great family, and, I'm not going to call it a safety net, but like it gives me some level of comfort. Like in the back of my mind, like 
if the world fucking fell apart, I could live at home, and I'd love living at home. Not that I ever would go back and live at home, but I knew like if every if the world cratered and I had nowhere else to go, I always had home, and I love my family, and I I could actually still live with my parents because we have such a great relationship. So in a weird way, I kind of in the back of my mind knew I always like why not go for fucking broke like whatever you want to do go chase it and go for it because in a worst case scenario you always have a place to go so if you had to give advice to someone who right now has a brilliant idea but they are scared to death to act on it mm -hmm. what do you say test it prove it out and I think I, I caution anyone just from dropping whatever they're going to do and just go chase an idea because you have to prove that there's a concept that there's a market for whatever that whatever the idea is so you use you're always better off being in a, in a safe place of having a job and an income. Mm -hmm. And if you're serious about it, then you'll put the extra, you'll find the time to develop this concept in parallel. Like you don't want to just cut cold and say, oh, I'm going to just dedicate all this time. We have no funding, no resources, no proof of concept. You don't even know if there's a market for it, right? So you want to do it in parallel. It's like the same person, like, I hate my job. I'm going to go find a new job. It's like the moment you leave your job and you don't have a job, it's twice as hard to find a new job. You're not that interesting. You're when, yeah, you're desperate. You're desperate. You're taking. And you're not that interesting. You know, to to a to an employer. You know, and you you always have more leverage when you're already in a place. You just hit a key point, and it's something that I always say, um, and I think that the viewers of this can get a lot out of it. It's more than eight hours a day. Of course. People are always talking about they want to do this, they want to do that, but I have a full time job. I have. You know these responsibilities i got kids i got whatever yeah. but you just brought up the point that you know if you're serious about it after work there's a whole nother eight hours here the weekends like you make the time like i love when people, i don't have time to work out i'm like you do you choose not to make the time you might have to wake up at five you might have to do it at nine o'clock at night but you're just choosing not to find the time in the day to do it it's okay and everything in life is a choice Right? You either make the time, and if you're serious about the idea and you love the idea that much, and you're that passionate about it, you prove it to yourself by spending that extra time and working hard around the clock to figure it out. Because if you're not willing to do that, you know, it's like the guy that's always like, oh, I'm going to be a script writer, but I can't really start until I get a computer. It's like, you're not serious about being a script writer, because the, the computer's not holding you back. Absolutely. So there's too many people in life that they're gonna do this once this thing happens. It's like those people are destined for failure. So if you're that person that you're waiting for something else, don't even consider it because you don't have what it takes. <laughs> it's true. That's Not everyone's meant that's to be an entrepreneur. Not everyone, everyone loves the fantasy. And I love, this is the greatest thing. Every chef thinks they should have their own restaurant, right? Oh, the restaurant's packed, everyone loves my food. I'm like, you're a great chef, but someone's created a great infrastructure for you to come in and all you have to do is be a chef. You want to be a restaurant owner? Great. Go take a, a, a lease and personally guarantee it, right? So go go take that risk. You know what a personal guarantee means? That if that restaurant folds in a year, so you're still on the hook for that lease for 10 years personally. Personally, that's risk. That's like that's risk. That's risk. Making food like that's what you do. You become a restaurant owner. Now you're dealing with payroll, insurance, liability, employees, everything but chefing, what you're great at. So every time someone's a great trainer, I should have my own gym. It's like, no, you're not. You're a trainer at Equinox, and they bring in the customers to you. You have not built it from the ground up. Such a great point. Such you know? a great point. So as, as long as people know their lane and what they're great at. But listen, if you're an amazing trainer and you have a great business partner that knows how to do all the stuff that, that needs to be done, and you could just be the face of the trainer, that's different. But like, too often, people think they're responsible for the success. Or I love people like, oh, I'm tired of building other people's companies. <laughs> I'm like, oh, why you got a guaranteed salary, bonuses, and vacation days, and you play, you are the role, like someone told me that, like at Miramax, oh, I'm tired of building, you know, Miramax. I'm like, you were a VP, one of 300 employees. What made you think you built that company? That is such an excellent point. I really hope everybody in this um, building is, is dialed in on what he's saying. Yeah, oh, because the truth point. is you have to respect the place that you work at. Like, they're taking risks. It's, it's no different like when you have a company that's like, oh, well, how much equity am I going to get? I'm like, you haven't even started and brought any value to the company. You already talked about equity. I'd always say, how much do you want? And they're like, oh, I was thinking like 5%. I'm like, why 5 Why not go for 10 if you're really committed to it? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I mean, I'd love to get 10. I'm like, great, you can take 10. 
I said, we value the company at $10 million. So if you want 10, that's a million dollars. Do you want to work for free for five years? Because you want $250,000 a year as well as 10%. So you want to just forego the $250,000 and you'll, you'll earn the 10%? Well, well no. I wanted the 250 plus 10 percent. Oh, you want me to give it to you? Oh, okay. <laughs> you brought nothing to the table. You came from a cush job, and you think you're adding value, but you haven't created any value. So I'm always hesitant for you know those type of people. They're not serious because if they really believed in themselves that much, they'd go do something on their own. I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I, and I think it, it, you you bring out so many gems and so many points that people really need to listen to because there's somebody out there who is talking and talking and talking but they're never doing yeah. and the people who do are ones who are ready to you know put it all on the line yeah. sink or swim it's like you know what i believe in what i'm you know what i have in my head and what i want to do and i'm willing to just go for it you know whether i have the resources or not i'll figure it out along the way so yeah. These are excellent points. Yeah. But again, I caution people that have those ideas, start working on it. Start proving that there's something there. In parallel to while you're doing a job that covers your bills and, 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 and makes you safe and comfortable. But put yourself in an uncomfortable situation by committing yourself to do to spend more time on it in your free time. Okay, so with that said, how much research went into you guys creating ebooks? This energy category, it feels oversaturated and it feels like there is an 800 pound gorilla in the room with, mm -hmm. you know, Red Bull and Monster. Mm -hmm. Like what makes you, and take me back to, to the beginning. What made you think that I could be a player in this space? And how much research did you do before you decided, hey, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna um, get this product together and put it out to market and test it? Yeah. Um well, I could tell you the truth, not a lot of research. I mean, I did, I, did some, I, I did some minor research on the size of the category and who the players were. So I would say I'm more instinct than research. Mm -hmm. So my instincts told me that there was a void in the white space. I mean, it did some basic stuff, but not like an MBA would analyze a business. There was no DAC, there was no, uh, you know, tons of data points other than just that I saw these other products doing it. And I'm like, we can create something better. And I think we can market it differently. What made eBoost different? Um, it was natural, so it was clean. It tasted better than the other products, and it had more vitamins, minerals, and performance-based products. In 08, the world was changing. You know, were you just thinking ahead of the curve at that point? When you say natural, like everything now is about being natural yeah. and clean. Did you see that white space, space at that time to say to yourself, like, whoa, I, I can fit in this lane and just do it a little bit differently because I see the world's changing and everybody's going natural. Yeah, I mean, I th I, we were early. We were definitely a little early on that. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes you could also be uh, b before the market is there and we were kind of like hindering. But I was also doing it as a passion. I mean, I was still running Buzz Tone and doing the other stuff. So I was doing it off the side of my desk, but with passion mm -hmm. and love. And it was small, it was like, you know, two, three people. Um, what categories did you start with first? Hotels. No, I'm talking about in terms of the product itself. Was it powders? Was it powders. shots? Powders. It was powders and tablets. Wh why? Um, easy to make, easy to carry, easy to ship. You know, direct to consumer was just starting, you know, people were buying stuff online. So I'm like, this goes in a little box and shows up at your doorstep. You know, beverage is a huge, is a whole different animal. Like that's an animal in itself that's much more complex and burdensome. But something that shows up for 295 you could ship it anywhere in the country and go door to door. You know, that, that makes it uh, a lower barrier to entry. So, whereas most people are looking at, you know, I want retail space. I was, You're thinking outside the box. Yeah, I was thinking more non-traditional channels. So, hotels, who was your first hotel partner? The W Hotels. Really? Yeah, so we How got How did you sell it in? Um, I, I knew the president, and so I just presented it to him. And I just said, hey, you should try this new product. I didn't even say I was associated with it. It's like, wow, this tastes great. This is amazing. I said, I, this would be great. I bet you, I stay at the W. I would love it if this was in your rooms. He goes, yeah, I should look into this and try and find out, you know, how we get this in our rooms. I said, I can help you. I know exactly how you can do it. He goes, how? I said, we just launched this product. It's our product. He's like, no way. So he connected us to the right person, and they made it a brand standard, and they put it in every room. Really? Yeah. 
How many different doors? How many uh, hotels? I think they had like 14 or 15 hotels, but this is where you become naive, right? So you start running numbers like, oh, if we're in 100,000 rooms, I think that people, you just start guessing, you know, we'll get six depletions per month per room, and you start running spreadsheets. You're like, holy shit, this thing's gonna be massive. Doesn't worry. If you're, if you're Coke or water or Snicker bar, you might get six depletions a month. If you're anything else, you're lucky if you get one a month. Correct. You know, so you don't really know anything until you have a customer and your customer basically tells you. So that's why you always have to prove out whatever it is you do, because in your mind it makes total logical sense. It's like an infomercial, right? Until that customer picks up the phone and orders it, it's a failure. It could be the prettiest spot in the world, the world's greatest product, but at the end of the day, the customer votes with the dollars. 100%. So, until the customer starts voting and, and giving you money for what you think is so great, then you'll know if you have something or not. Or your messaging could be wrong, Your market, there's a lot of other elements to still get to that information of the customer, but until those things, those two things happen, commerce has happened with your product and a customer, that's when you start to know you have something. So this is 08, we're about 11 years in now. Yeah. Tell me about some of the challenges you have because every entrepreneur comes out of the gate and they think, you know, I'm gonna hit it out the park. You know, I have the best product, I have the best service in the world. People are gonna see what I'm doing and I'm gonna be an overnight success. What are some of the different challenges that you faced, especially in a category that you didn't do much research in? Yeah. Uh -oh. We started from scratch. We didn't know anything about the space. Wow. Yeah, didn't know anyone or anything. Well, the irony is the guy that I was going to do the deal with 50 Cent, was he was going to be my partner. So I pitched him. I said, well, since 50 didn't work out, let's just do this product together. He said, great. He said, that'd be fun. So we're talking about the product. I'm bringing in Barack and his samples. And like, I go to his office and it's like the third time sample that he's made. And there's floating particles. I'm like, this thing has to dissolve violently violently and he puts it in it's like plop plop fizz <laughs> fizz fizz i'm like this shit's way too slow and then there's like floating particles he's like no it's fine he starts stabbing him with a spoon i'm like oh shit he doesn't get it like we're never gonna get to the finish line with this guy amazing guy he's quirky but amazing but i'm like he just doesn't get it and so i left there and i'm like he can't be our partner wow and so i called a friend that was in the industry i'm like who makes products like that we wanted to do was oh this guy in new jersey keith frankel i'm like can you introduce me to him he's like yeah so we go out and we meet keith and first of all i pull up and there's a bentley in the driveway in this huge building i'm like all right i already like the looks of this and i'm in the conference room i see pictures of this guy in a private chat and i'm like i like this guy a lot <laughs> and then he comes in and he's just a bigger than life personality and amazing and he's like i know exactly what you need come back in a week and i'll have samples for you oh yes he did and he nailed it yeah so he's been our partner ever since Nice, nice. So, finding the right partner, that's always difficult. Yeah. Number one, you know, great, he knows the business, but he could have been a dick to work with. Yeah. For you, is it always a plus to bring a partner on board, or do you prefer <clears throat> to be a solopreneur? I think it all is, I think it all depends on the individual. I think some people like to hear their own ideas and only work off their own ideas. I think other people work better in collaborative environments. I think other people can find strengths in, in larger numbers of people where each person is great and, you know, like I'm not, I'm, I'm a horrible operations person. I'm not like a people, I'm not like, I don't like managing people. Like I'm, I don't like paying attention to those small details or like the coddling part of it. So like if there's other people that can do that, that's great. So. I, I like the idea of having partners or having people that can do things better than you in important assets of the business. You go from these non-traditional channels in terms of distribution. <coughs> At what point do you say, okay, great, we have our hotels online, but I re if I'm gonna really grow, I need to go traditional. I need to be in these national retail chains. I mean, it was kind of a, a natural evolution. Um, and the, the truth is, I, if I look backwards, I do a bunch of things differently. Like what? I mean, Name the top two things you do differently. I mean, I saw early on the future as direct to consumer mm -hmm. and Amazon was just, we were early on Amazon. If I would have just put all my energy in figuring out direct to consumer and hiring like people that really knew that space, that would have been a game changer. 
and we'd probably have a different set of products too because they would be, be more functionally based that were um, that work in that environment better. So I would definitely have done that. I would have raised more money at one time and built a real team of people with a real like all right let's go really take a swing and attack it we kind of slow rolled it where we always had enough money to stay in business but never enough money to do anything really effectively mm -hmm. and, and if you want to build a business you got to have resources and that's people finance it takes it takes it takes an army of people to, to bring it to, to, to scale an idea or a business and so we've never really had that so if I reversed it, I would have hired that and really focused on direct-to-consumer and then really raised a proper amount of money to build out more infrastructure. Talk about raising money because that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs and, you know, people are so enamored with shows like Shark Tank. Yeah. Um, whereas before they even get the product out the door, they're raising money. At what point do you say from an entrepreneur standpoint, is it time to go out and start raising this money? Because I hear people speak about their dreams and hopes and you know they want to build these successful businesses, but before they even have a label on the product, they're talking about, I need to go raise money. Everybody's yeah. looking at what's happening in um, Silicon Valley yeah. and seeing these, you know, dollars being raised. For you, is it better to get it out the door first and build it and show that there's a demand for this product and then seek um, raising capital for it? Or do you see it as a reverse? The I, I think it all depends on who the person is, what the product is, and what the financial needs are. I mean, we've self-funded it initially, and then I had a friend who's like, I want to be part of this, I want to put money into it. So it was very organic, mm -hmm. and we were very fortunate. Uh, that he put in the money that he did because it needs capital, right? And you know, I spent a lot of time not taking any money from the business. I actually spending my personal life savings, you know, <coughs> to fund my personal life because I wasn't taking money from the business. So that's funding the business. So I caution anyone from doing that. I probably wouldn't do that again, to be honest with you. Um, so I think you have to prove that you have an idea that could be meaningful enough that justifies raising capital because capital comes expectations too. People expect to return on their investment. Absolutely. You know, I have, unfortunately, I know a lot of people, but I haven't met a lot of people that said, I need some good tax write-offs. Let me give you some money. <laughs> and maybe I should figure that out because that would be a nice place to be. Speaking of you knowing a lot of people, what you do, did you, go, <laughs> did you go back to any of your celebrity friends and say, hey, you know, I'm looking for you to get involved even as an endorser? or bringing money into the business. And it's a whole different story when you're asking people for money. Yeah. So how did that look for you? you know, Knocking on doors of some of your celebrity friends. I didn't really ask them. Really? I didn't really I didn't really ask them. I kind of wanted to, them to want to be part of it. So if they asked me or they showed any level of interest, then I would engage. Um, but I didn't really go asking them. or And I never really did the endorsement thing either. So, I know Jillian Michaels is associated with that. She was. Okay. Um, yeah, we created kind of like a, a mutually beneficial relationship. And the truth is, in any, and I'll say this to anyone, I was like, oh, I'll get a celebrity, I'll get a huge influencer, and they're gonna, they're gonna help me scale my business. No, they're not. Unless you have resources to promote that association, and unless they're committed to the business, the way that Puffy is with Chirac, right? Mm -hmm. He's shameless. But he also has the resources of Diageo and a huge marketing budget to bring that to life in the biggest way possible. So it's a success. He, he lives and breathes it. He's got everyone around him with the bottle in his hand and talk about it. He's constantly talking about it, but he has the infrastructure and the resources behind it. Too many people think, oh, I'm going to get this celebrity and they're going to talk about it. They're going to post about it. <coughs> a post is like throwing a lawn chair off the Titanic. It does zero. Zero. Unless they're consistently doing it, if it's not authentic, and if they're not living it in a way that, that their friends, family, followers be like, oh, I believe that. Yeah, that's a that's a common mistake that um, yeah. people make. They mm -hmm. you know they don't look for people who are authentic to their product. Yeah. You know it's a terrible thing to give somebody who doesn't drink. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> with a, yeah. A, a short deal. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. it just doesn't make sense. But in life, there's no short. There's no shortcuts. There's no silver bullets. There's very few things like oh, if I get this, all of a sudden it's going to do that. There's there's so many more moving pieces for anything to be successful. That's the scary part of 
you know, this social media culture, and many of the people who, you know, are going to view this, they're, they, you know, they, they're, they're millennials, yeah. and they look at other people's feed and they're starstruck, and they really think that what they're seeing is real, and yeah. it's not. It's somebody else's highlight reel. Yeah. People don't understand the work that it really takes to build a business, build it out, scale it, and make it profitable because you can be in business for many years and you're literally just breaking even at best. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, you can't, you can't, what you see on social media, you can't take for um, the, the, the 100% reality because it's not. It's their best version of their reality. But do you, think that the, do you think people are really, um, because I think lack of patience is something that so many young startup companies um, suffer from mm -hmm. because they're expecting this overnight success. Would you attribute some of that to social media? Well, yeah, because you, 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 if you're influenced by the people around you and you think everyone else is doing so fantastic, um, then you, you, your idea is like, well, I'm going to do the exact same blueprint that they did and I should be in the same place they did. It's, it's, everyone does this, right? Well, I'm going to go into the energy category and it's a $12 billion category and I'm just going to get 1%. I'm going to get 1% of the category. I'm going to have a one point, you know, $120 million company just by getting 1%. I'm like, you're not even going to get a, a hundredth of a percent because it's just not that easy. But anytime someone gives me um, an example of like they're just going to capture 2 or 5 or 1% of the category just because they think it's just going to fall off the plate and fall in their business, it just doesn't work like that. Josh, at this point I'm going to go back because it's an important question for me. You're in the books. Oh wait. What year did you, did you get married? Um, 2005. 05. Yeah. So by the time you started eating books, you were yeah. already married. Yeah. Speak to me about some of the challenges because being an entrepreneur, being someone who is committed to success, it's you have to be laser focused. Sharing your focus with anything or anybody is difficult. Yeah. And that's why so many businessmen are working on their second, third, fourth marriage. How did you navigate that life? Because 05, you're still working with Bus Tone. Mm -hmm. 08, you're switching over to Epoos. Yeah. You said to me many years ago, you know, I asked you about your wife. Yeah. It was, and I don't even know if you remember it, but I thought it was so dope. You were like, oh, she's great. I love her more and more every day. Yeah. And I thought that that was just a, 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 a great way of describing how you feel about her. But how do you keep things intact if, you know, your business, that is your baby. That is, you're married to your business. That's yeah. the only way that it can work. Yeah. Well, it worked for me because she also had her own life. So she had her own profession. So she was busy with her job as well. So I think if she was a stay-at-home wife mm -hmm. and just depended upon me and us being together for her happiness, then I think it would have been much more of a challenge. But she was very independent and not needy and very supportive. So it, it takes that because I know other people that don't have that support and it becomes a lot of friction yeah, and resentment and resentment. Resentment in which way? We resent, like, they don't understand how hard you're hustling or the sacrifices that you're making, and they're just thinking, like, well, you're spending no time with me. You've been home, you know, you're out every night. It's like, yeah, I'm raising money. Like, I'm hustling to get the money to do the business that's going to put the roof over our head. Like, they don't... So, my wife was very amazing in that way. She got it, so she was incredibly supportive. But I, have, I know other people that don't have that same kind of support, and there's just a lot of friction, and they don't want to go home, to be honest with you. I don't want to go home and hear that shit. Yeah, but this is the part of the business, uh, this is the part of business most people don't talk about. Yeah. Because you're literally sharing your life. Your, yeah. your, 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 your personal life with your business life. Yeah. If you can give any quick um, advice to somebody who's coming up in business and, you know, they have a wife or a husband uh -huh. who wants their time equally. Yeah. What advice would you give? I think you have to manage expectations from the get-go. You have to say this is, and you have to get them 
excited about your business because you're going to need their moral support, right? Like you're going to have rough days and you want them to be, you want to be able to share with them like why it was rough and you want them to be a cheerleader for you. Like, oh, don't worry about it. You could do X, Y, or Z or you'll get it. You know, the tide will change, well, well, the tide will turn. But like, if you don't have that, if they're not that informed on the challenges that you have in your business, you can't sympath they can't sympathize with you. So you can't share that, but they have to be know they have to know about it in order to have sympathy for you. But if they're just constantly complaining that they're not getting any time and they're not um, respectful of the sacrifices and the work that you're putting in your business, then you're gonna always be butting heads. And a lot of people double think, right? Like they won't share the information and they'll just, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what they really want to say is something completely different. So you want to have an environment where you, you can openly communicate about the successes and the failures, the challenges and the, the optimistic things that are happening. And you want them to be kind of your ride or die in that situation. Yeah, I think that that's an important, um, that's very important for people who are thinking about going into business, people who are really pursuing their careers, whether it's in corporate, you have to pick the, pick the right partner. You know, 100%. That, that, that right partner, that support system is mm -hmm. so vitally important because it, it can be a make or break yeah. in your performance or the performance of anything you're trying to create. Yeah, and, and just your home life won't work. Yeah, I mean, you said earlier, you know, like, you know, people who just don't want to go home, and it's, it's, that, that's it's such a true statement. I know so many people, who, you know, why would I want to go home? Like, like that's the worst part of my day, yeah. because that person is no longer, or I wouldn't say no longer, but that person yeah. doesn't understand yeah. you being in the street is keeping a roof over it, mm -hmm. and you're building something bigger. Yeah. So, I mean, it's both people's responsibility to kind of like create that communication and talk it through and, and manage expectations. So many people, and just to switch up, and, and, you know, we stand on the uh, topic of relationships. So many people know you or would recognize your face from the real housewives in New York. You didn't think I was going to hit you with that one. I was, I was <laughs> sorry you did. But it still comes into this business conversation. How'd that work out for you guys? Because it, it always seems like the kiss of death when couples go on television together, they go on these reality TV shows together. How did that work out for you um, personally, but in terms of business, did it help evils? Um, I'll say from business, it definitely raised some awareness because I was shamelessly pimping it. So <laughs> there's no question. I'm like, if we're gonna, if we're gonna put ourselves in this horrible situation, I'm gonna get something out of it. Um, and again, my wife did not pursue it. It literally fell on her lap. When I say like literally she was at a dinner and Andy Cohen was there and like, I want you on my show. And Are you serious? Yeah, it was like literally like, it was, it just literally fell on her lap. Like she had no desires or aspirations, but she's like, what should I do? I said, fuck it, do it, why not? Like she also felt like when you have kids, we have two children at home and she's been working on her own since she was 16 years old and making enough money to support herself, you know, all those years and then even when we were married like she had a successful career um, and then you have kids and then your life changes because you stop doing your work and you're managing two kids at home and I'm still living my life and I'm going out and I'm doing some fun things as well and she feels like she's she's out of that mix mm -hmm. and your mindset changes too like you know all you can think about is like oh I got to get up at seven and I got to feed the kids and then get them to school and do that and I'm like I think if you do this it might give you a reason to like get back in the mix in some way, shape, or form. It'll give you like a new life, and which it did. So from that from that perspective, it was amazing for her because it kind of like re-energized her and got her back out. Like, all right, you know what? Like, I could still be active. I could still do the things that I used to do, even with kids. Nice. So I think that perspective would help. I mean, the concept of the show is the worst show in the world because you could sit and have the greatest time in the world, but they'll, they'll edit like six different pieces together to show like there's all this tension and friction and it's not exactly how it actually works. So from that perspective, unfortunately, people like to watch people fighting and tension and unhappiness. They don't enjoy people having a good time. That sells. That, that's what sells. So. But you did oh. shamelessly plug equals. I did. I did. <laughs> it was funny because Andy Cohen goes, you're going to look like an asshole. But you got a lot of great promotion. Are you freedom. serious? Yeah, he said that at the very beginning. But he's like, he goes, it's just the nature of the show. Like, there has to be, like, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a nice way, he said, your wife's boring, which means she's nice. So we have to create some tension points. And the only tension could be, like, you two. So an example would be she'd come home and she'd be like, um, why don't you ever give me flowers? 
And I'd laugh. I'm like, well, why don't you ever make me dinner? And we'd both laugh. And then it would cut to her like, well, why don't you ever make me dinner? And then cut to her crying. <laughs> and she laughs. She <laughs> cry. <laughs> you know? So unfortunately, and I'm not, it's just not me. That happens to everyone in that reality space. So unfortunately, they don't paint a true picture of... Would you ever do it again? Never. Are you serious? No. You can't control, like, if you can't have control over, like, who you really are or, like, the nature of your relationship. Like, if it was Shark Tank, I would do Shark Tank. But no more reality. No. Even if it meant you're getting millions of dollars in free publicity for ebooks. No. I don't, I mean, I, I guess it would depend on the format, but not, not in that kind of format. Got you. Go back to ebooks for a second. Start out with shots, pills, where are you at now? So we, we, about three years ago, we did the total rebrand. Okay. Uh, we started in powders and then we did shots and, um, and then we added like protein and greens and probiotics and all that. And then we kind of looked at, and we've never been financed enough to really like really jam that down like retail's throat. So it's, it's really tough to scale a lot of those items unless you've got a lot of infrastructure. We're still small, we're like seven people. So we're very lean and mean. Um, and so we just kind of looked at the revenues and we're like, you know, 80% of the revenues are coming from these products. So let's just go deeper in these products and forget about the other ones that are really financially a bit of a drag because you got to carry inventory, packaging. It just When you have a lot of SKUs, it's it's just a lot of heavy lifting mm -hmm. on the back end and, and manufacturing and out of stocks and short dated product. And there's a lot of moving pieces. So we said, let's just focus on the winners and go deeper with those. So we kind of cut that other stuff and we just kept our super powders, which is our um, legacy product, the first product that we created. And then we created a pre-workout, um, which is doing phenomenal. And then we're just building off of that. So we just developed it. What's your number one product now? Our, our pre-workout is our best seller right really? now. Yeah. So it's clean, natural. There's not a lot of those on that side of the space. It tastes good and it's highly efficacious. So that, and then we, a year ago, we created a joint venture with Arizona Beverages because it basically went to them and said, you have this amazing platform. You never want to sell the company, but let's incubate brands off your platform. And we have a lot of uh, awareness around our powder, but if we put this in a can, that's a game changer for us. So that was, that's this product. That's this product right here. Yeah. So this has been on the market for how long? Since March. How long is it doing? Uh, it's doing. We were out of stock for six weeks. It, we really? went through, you know, a half a million pieces in like two months, which is, you know, Don, the owner of Arizona, thought it would take, you know, eight to twelve months for us to go through five hundred thousand pieces, and we literally did it in like two months. Wow! So the demand is like we're, we're we're at the right time, at the right place, with the right product. What type of marketing did you do? Nothing. I mean, just like basic social and. You know, I, when I, to me, marketing is like if you have a real budget, you can go activate some stuff. Everything we did was with no budget. Very grassroots. Yeah. So you're going back to your beginnings. Yeah. So what's next for Josh? What's next for eBoost? Is the plan to scale the company and sell? Do you plan to have the company forever? Like, I, you know what? The, the plan is just to make it successful. And if it's successful, then you might have some options. But everyone talks about like, oh, I'm going to do this in three years, sell it. Everyone's raising money in the food and beverage space. And if you look at everyone's deck and their and their spreadsheet and their projections, like, oh, we'll do four this year, we'll do 12 next year, we'll do 30, and then we'll sell it. They make it sound like it's just so easy. It's just not easy. It's really not easy. And beverages are harder than anything because the, the weight, the cost, slotting fees, distribution, like there's so many moving pieces. So like if I wanted to build this on my own, I'd probably have to raise $25 million. Really? To be successful, yeah. But you think Arizona been a great partner? They've been amazing. Really? So they have, you know, an infrastructure, 70 salespeople, trucks, distribution. So to be able to tap into all that and not have to go build it has been a value. We're coming to the close of the interview, and um, I typically ask the same question to each of the guests. For Josh, and I want you to think over the course of your life, what's the best advice you ever received? The best advice I've ever received is, and I think it's just, it, it just, it carries over to everything. If you don't want weeds in your backyard, then go pick them. Essentially, you're accountable, but like, don't complain about anything if you're not willing to go remove them. So you just have to take accountability and responsibility for whatever in your life, because 
at the end of the day, you're responsible for your own happiness or your own success or your own failures. You might have headwinds and challenges more so than other people, but at the end of the day, you're still accountable for yourself. And I think that's the most important thing that people have to look in the mirror and take that accountability because it's easy to pass blame or talk about situations that happen that put them in this situation. Like, no matter what the situation, it's always been worse for someone else and they've overcome it. So you just have to take accountability. What's the worst advice you ever received? <laughs> this shit would be easy. <laughs> Yeah, I thought, you know, oh, you've got a great product, it's gonna be so easy. I'm like, no, it's not. There's no shortcuts. I've looked everywhere for a shortcut, I've never found one. Come close, but I always got stopped on the one yard line. So it really always comes down to the work. Yeah. You've gotta put the work in, there is no shortcuts. Yeah. Looking over your life, if you can go back and talk to your 21 year old self, what would you tell them? Um, I talked to my 18 year old self before I went to college and I would have taken school and education much more serious because I think those are the f fundamentally those tools and gotten like a master's degree and other stuff because I think those are incredibly important tools to have to teach you how to start something and finish something because education and intellectual um, stamina and knowledge is incredibly important um, so I think I would have I regret not doing better in school and pushing myself to get more degrees. Before we move forward, I think that this is such a great point that you're making because there are so many people out here now, um, these different speakers, who are slamming college, they're slamming education, um, they're slamming any type of form of education. You know, oh, you don't need college, you don't need school. You know, just go out there and make it happen. And I think that it's incredibly irresponsible and reckless for these people to say that. Yes, there are a few people who, um, you know, have been able to make it happen and did it on hustle and muscle and just grit and figuring things out. But who's to say, you know, everyone learns differently. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can ever get enough education. So I think that that's a wonderful point that you yeah. just brought up. And, and it doesn't have to come from college. It could come from just being a student of something that you love and you're passionate about, but you understand it from top to down. So it was film. You understood all the greatest filmmakers, what made them great. Just study whatever you're passionate about. Just become an expert in it. I think I know the answer to this question, but it would be my last. At what point did you know I arrived? At what point did you look in the mirror and say to yourself, you know, I'm doing pretty good for myself. I, I, I kind of made it. Honestly, it was, I would think, uh, the moment I felt that was when I was sitting at a table with Puffy and Andre Harrell. Because I was, I loved that music and I was very aware of who Andre Harrell was and I was a little bit mesmerized. I'm like, this guy sounds amazing. Like, he, he, he almost felt like a... a a character out of the movie because he lived in New York and he was like, you know, breaking artists like Mary J. Blige and Jodeci and I lived in this little town, Danville. So it just felt like a whole nother world apart. So then to, to, to actually be sitting at a table and be doing business with them, I'm like, fuck, it's kind of crazy that I came from this little white town, Danville, California, and here I'm in New York City at this table with these two very powerful guys in the music industry. So out of all of the moments in your life, that's the one that sticks out? I was the one that just really resonated with it. Josh, thanks so much for coming and sharing with us. Please give it up for Paul Montego and Josh Tate. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.